Hi everybody, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to talk about day two in my vacation trip to get my tires fixed in Peru. So we started out again today in Piura at the Wyndham Hotel having breakfast early and then getting a taxi pretty quickly and on the road to today we were going to Sutura. So we had found a whole lot of really interesting beaches along the coast down in the Sutura area that uh, we were really looking forward to psyching ourselves out all morning during breakfast saying how beautiful the day was going to be and we were going to have so much fun on these beaches and possibly see some sea lions or walruses some type of life out there um, along the beach and just really have a great day. So we did negotiate a ride. We got to a mm, kind of like a taxi port. It was a, a place where there are all the different taxis come to and then you negotiate to go the rest of the way wherever you were going to go. Because where we stopped there really wasn't much anywhere near around there. So We tried to go to the beaches we were looking for, but the taxi drivers in that area were, were charging a lot of money. And they were, they were wanting to charge so much. I mean, I didn't take that much money with us. So I would have had maybe enough to get there, but not enough to get back. And so we, we decided that was way too much money to go to a deserted beach. Santiago continued to work with other taxi drivers so we found a van that was loading up and would go pretty close to where we wanted. And he agreed to pull in a little further to get us to the beach. And so we waited and waited, eagerly excited to go to the beaches. And as they started packing in all the people on the van, which took, you know, 30, 40 minutes, um, it was getting too tight and I happened to remember that oh by the way I get a little claustrophobic and uh, so as they added the last two people on uh, I told Santi I said okay I can't go we're gonna have to get off and go find something else to do so we got off they did get two more people but they lost two people so it is what it is but I could not have made that trip in a good way so we got off then we got off and it's like okay now we're here in the middle of nowhere where can we go what can we do um, you know find us something somewhere to go to so Santi worked his magic and he looked online he found a ghost town that was not too far um, so the ghost town was in a place called Chuliachi and I know I am butchering words, so please forgive me, but um, is what it is. I'm from south in the U.S., so forgive my words. But anyhow, we, we took off. He negotiated a ride with a taxi driver, and I will have to say I investigated going to Peru, Pura in general, and everything I read online, it was known as the land of eternal heat. I'm from Texas. I know what heat is. And it's a desert. So you would think it'd be warm. No, it was not. <laughs> so as we drove towards the ghost town, I was huddled up behind my backpack just trying to keep the wind off of me because it was so cold. And it was still early in the morning. The sun really hadn't come out. And I will have to say, almost the whole time we were in Peru, it was fairly overcast. And Santi was telling me this is very unusual. And it's like, okay, I like unusual because it was cooler than normal. So it, it was okay for me. So the taxi driver, he did a great job. He, he drove us way on out there. It was a pretty good ways from where we were. And he took us straight up to the church in this ghost town, which 
you get out and you're just in awe. I mean, it was, it was incredible. Um, granted, there was no roof and there wasn't a lot left there, but the massiveness of it, it was, it was incredible. And the first thing I'm going to say I noticed was the wall where, where it had been eroding, the, the bricks weren't normal bricks. They were made out of um, stone and seashells. So it looked just amazing. And the elements, you know, the, the wind and the salt in the air and everything had eroded the face of it. So you could see through to the brick and sometimes there was no brick, but the mortar held. So the mortar was still in place um, from the cement, but it was incredible. So on day two, we did several things, so you don't get lost in the video. Um, we did the ghost town. The ghost town led to what I'm going to call the ghost beach because there was nobody out there. It was deserted. It was amazing. It was beautiful. Um, it was just us and the birds. We were the only ones there with the taxi driver. After the ghost town we went to the mangroves and after the mangroves we went to a little zoo but for now um, Santiago did some beautiful drone footage for me of the ghost town so I really want you to be able to see the footprint of this ghost town to see how large this place was it I expected something really small but to me, it was a lot larger than I expected. I'm not quite sure how many people actually lived in the town. But if you look at how large that church was, I think a lot of people came to church. Otherwise, it would have been a smaller church. But enjoy the drone footage and then I'll be right back. Okay, so one of the first things I want to say about the ghost town that really surprised me is here you have a structure. I mean, it's been quite a few years since the, the ghost town fell apart. 
why did no one ever come back in and reclaim this space and um, utilize these houses just add a roof back on what what happened it really gave me more questions and answers and I guess when you don't find a lot of information about a place like this it lets your mind wander as to what really happened there is not I could not find a lot of information about it online evidently a tsunami came and basically just wiped the town out so the story is that a tsunami was coming and that some sea lions or whatnot were on the beach just pitching a fit which actually warned the people of the town that something was coming and so a lot of people evidently got out and saved their lives but evidently quite a few people did not make it out so the best I could come up with is maybe about 50 people uh, passed away in the uh, in the tsunami and maybe that's why they didn't come back in and build I'm not sure what happened to the people that got out or how many people were even in the town so from what I can find out the town was built in the 1960s and one thing that I could use to confirm this was I found the headers on the doors. Some of them had the year that the house was built. And to me, that was just absolutely amazing. I wish all the houses would have put the year that they were built. I only found two. I think there may have been one more that maybe I couldn't see. But it was, it was really interesting. It's a little eerie walking through the town, wondering what happened to everybody and how it all turned out but it was amazing to go in and see these structures still standing so again the how the the town was built around uh, the 1960s the closest thing I could find was the tsunami hit around 1983 I think so they had um, about 20 years in this town it's a little fisherman's town because they lived right off the coast uh, not a long time to to live there but uh, hopefully their life there was good while they were there so we walked through the town it was it was really amazing i mean you just saw the outer structure i think the drone footage that Santi took was actually more revealing to me and that um, they weren't, a, you know, little bitty individual row houses. It looked like some spaces were larger. Um, when you're walking through it, you can't quite tell because a lot of the uh, walls are down and we're, there's a lot of scrub brush, you know, all over the place. So we walked through the town. I'm going to say we spent quite a, quite a while there and just in awe of all the the pieces that were still there and the town went you know basically the church was on one end and as you walked through the streets of the town you walked towards the beach which was kind of nice and i read somewhere that there was actually a church on both ends of the town so i'm not sure what structure on the other end or if maybe that whole church at the other end maybe got wiped out or if there actually was another church, I'm not sure. There was a structure that was built at a later point, I think, but it was made out of regular brick. And I talked to Santi about it, and he, one of the things he said is like, well, they don't use regular brick because of the salt air and the sand and everything. It wouldn't, the regular brick just wouldn't hold up. And I will say the, the building that was there, you know, the brick, well, it was still there, so I don't know if it holds up better or not. Um, or when that building was created or how long it had been. So maybe just since 1983, but the brick was, you know, not completely eroded. But anyhow, as we walked out onto the beach, the sand dunes actually, in some areas, went up over the wall of 
the house, the, the structures that were there. And I don't know if there was anything under the sand that we were walking on, if there were more structures that we couldn't even see, or if that was the first structures, who knows. But it was really, really cool. But then when we got to the beach, it got even a little bit more eerie because there were all these boats along the beach just completely abandoned. The boats and the water all abandoned. And while you're there and you just walk through a ghost town and, and all of that, it's, it was kind of interesting because, again, your mind wanders. But again, I have to say it was win it's winter over there. And I think it's not fishing season. Those aren't the only vacant fishing boats out in the water that we saw. Um, so maybe it's that eerie, maybe it's not, but it was kind of weird seeing everything just deserted. It was a good day for us. We, we really enjoyed it. So I hope you enjoy the pictures of the beach and the ghost town and everything that that has to offer. But after that, we went to the mangroves. And so the mangroves themselves were interesting. It's where the salt water comes in and meets the fresh water. And so the, the birds and the wildlife there are, they were fun. So there were crabs. I didn't even realize how many different crabs there were. So on the trip, we saw the crabs at the mangroves, which were interesting. They had big claws. And then we saw a different crabs when we went to along the coast to Kalan. So uh, different crabs, different colors, different characteristics. Um, when there's not birds, I guess there's crabs. So we did get some pictures of the birds. After the mangroves, we went to another area that had like a tank of water with a lot of birds. And as we were there, I noticed up on the shore behind where these birds were, because we were now further away from the beach, these big fishing vessels sitting up there in the sand. Now these looked old enough that they could have, maybe when the tsunami came and wiped out the town, maybe these are some of the boats from that tsunami because they were just all um, falling apart up there behind these birds and kind of interesting. After that, we went to the zoo. And you know, I love zoos. I love zoos in South America because they're more of rehabilitation places for the animals. Um, some zoos are better than others. This one was pretty simplistic. Um, I was hoping to find a lot of different animals. I'm gonna say they had monkeys. They all have monkeys. This one had a couple of llamas and it had some goats. I'm not sure those were zoo animals. Maybe they were, you know, just animals for the people that lived there. Um, and they had a lot of birds. Now I will say some of the birds were interesting because some of the birds in the cage had a friend bird not in a cage. <laughs> and so it was really interesting watching him come into the cage and, um, talk to the one that was in the cage. I don't know, maybe they were conspiring to escape, who knows, but uh, it was interesting to watch them anyway. They didn't have a lot beyond that. It was mostly the birds and a couple of monkeys. Um, they had some other structures that didn't have anything in them, so whatever they were holding maybe got well enough to go back into the wild. So, did I see? Maybe there was some like iguana type lizards there, but not very many, and maybe some guineas. But anyhow, the zoo was the zoo, and I didn't get a, good, a lot of good pictures just because the structures that they had built for the to hold the animals were a lot more fortified than some of the other zoos that we've been to. And I think that's because maybe they have more wild predators around there that they're trying to protect them from. Um, so if you want to heal animals and get them back on the road, you don't want their predators to come after them. 
So I think maybe that's why it was a lot more fortified that it looked like they'd done a lot to, um, these animals aren't ones that are gonna dig out. So I think something may try to get in at the different times. So they were protecting them nonetheless. So that was day two, not quite as long as day one. Either that or I was a lot more chatty for day one. But I hope you enjoyed the drone footage and that you'll enjoy the rest of these pictures. And we'll see you the next time for day three.